Wow, this is the 100th episode of the Audio Branding Podcast. Thanks so much for being here. Welcome to Audio Branding, the hidden gem of marketing. Sound plays a more important role in human behavior and our decision-making than you may realize. In this podcast, I'll help you understand the art and science of sound so you can better influence others in business and your life. I'm your host, Jody Krangle. Let's delve a little deeper. Sound is important, probably a lot more important than we give it credit for. When I started this podcast, I definitely wanted as many people as possible to know that their audio shouldn't be an afterthought. It's a subject I'm really passionate about. But as I spoke with people about this topic, I learned that I had a lot more to learn about it. Ultimately, I'm on the same journey of discovery that you are. Every guest I've had on the show has shared valuable information about how sound shapes us, and I've definitely been fascinated by the depth of these conversations. I hope you have too. There's so much to unpack here, and these samples really just give you a basic overview, but I'll pass on the episode numbers of each so you can go back and listen to any that intrigue you. And of course, I didn't have time to mention every episode, but it's all at audiobrandingpodcast.com, so you can go there and listen anytime. In the meantime, the journey continues. Thanks so much to my colleague and friend Umberto Franco for his tremendous job in editing these episodes so that they sound as good as they possibly can. And I hope you'll join me for the next 100 episodes. This is a portion of episode number 19 with audio alchemist Steve Keller. So what have you made? <laughs> <laughs> what have we made? Yes. Um, last year we worked with Propel, um, kind of developing an experience for them. The taste of Propel. Yes. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of my passions is, is gastrophysics, um, uh, which I've done uh, with a couple of researchers. Uh, one, Charles Spence, who heads the Crossmodal Research Laboratory at Oxford University. And then Janice Wang, who uh, is now teaching at the Department of Food Science at uh, Aarhus University uh, in uh, Denmark. Mm -hmm. And uh, we worked with Propel to try and tease out um, what were what we call uh, sonically congruent um, soundscapes uh, with the taste of electrolytes, which is essentially sodium, and the taste of fruit, which is sweetness. And we found through research that we can actually uh, hack into your perception of flavor by what we're putting in your ears, not just what we're putting in your mouth. How cool is that? <laughs> so we, we developed some soundscapes. We created a, an app called the Flavor DJ. Um, and while people were drinking their Propel, they could move a fader to the electrolyte side um, or to the fruit side and actually change their perception of the, the sweetness um, of Propel. And it's just, you know, it's always amazing. You know, it's, it's, it's science, but it seems like magic. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and to, you know, have people go through this experience and realize that they actually are, it does taste different. Um, but it's, it's basically a, we call it a cross-modal hack. It's playing with their senses in the same way that uh, a synesthete has um, their their senses cross-wired in their brain. Sure. So when they smell something, may, they may actually hear it too, or they see something, uh, there may be another sense that's triggered at the same, same time. So we just play with that in a really natural way. Hey, Jody, it's Marie Hoffman. I just listened to your podcast with Jim Canelli and Sam Euphret, and the excitement and positivity that they brought to the podcast about the future of voiceover and synthetic voices and AI was palpable. I felt like I went to four years of college in your 31-minute podcast. Thank you so much for airing this. Keep up the good work. Here's a portion of episode number 81 with Jim Kennelly and Sam Euphret from Lotus Productions in New York City. What kind of voice trends were you hearing up until COVID and then after COVID? There's always been trends in voiceovers. You know, my, to be fair, my career goes back to the, you know, early 1980s. Uh, obviously a very male-dominated moment in, in the voiceover business. Uh, 
And today, you know, we see almost a 100% flip. We see younger female voices as being so popular and certainly younger female versa- voices with a lot of diversity mixed into it. Uh, mm-hmm. Pre-COVID, uh, you know, you kind of had that brighter, lighter thing, both in the male and female side. Uh, Post-COVID, uh, actually in specific, a little, an addition of like a, a little more mature female voice, like uh, 35, 45, 50, with love to all women in those age brackets. Uh, I've you, definitely benefited from this, I have you, to say. You saw that <laughs> enter in because they want this empathetic, reassuring voice, which I think will continue for a while. Uh, but very much so, and, and Sam can talk about about the, the addition of diversity, which is actually a, a big yeah. a big thing that Lotus is about. What do you say, yeah, Sam? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so, you know, if anybody's ever gotten one of my emails for an audition, you know that I'm on the bandwagon about diversity. I'm not here to play around. I'm not here to say, hey, you know, we're only casting one kind of vice. No. Lotus, even before I was there, was all about getting people who deserve to be there. And that was everybody. That didn't just mean like, oh, we're only going to cast white people. We're only going to cast so-and-so. We're going to typecast you. We're going to niche you. No, it was never about that. And we were always lucky enough to kind of be on that bandwagon before everybody realized, hey, I need to get on it too. So Mm -hmm. I'm glad that there's a lot of diversity. I'm just disappointed it took that long to get to where we are now. And my hope is that it stays that way. And the reason I think it will is because what's happening? You have people who are in the middle to late tiers of the millennial generation and the beginnings of Gen Z coming into the workforce. They're tired of not seeing themselves in media. When you look, you always have to keep your mind that the producers and the casting agents and your clients are younger. Everybody's young in the voiceover business and the advertising game. It's a young person's game. So whether you're a talent or you're an agent and you're looking for talent, uh, you want to c- focus on the fact that the, your clients are younger. And so mm-hmm. they want a variety of ideas. They want a variety of voices. So that's why we've always you know, been fans and, and try to be as active and vocal about it as we can. This is a small portion of episode number 79 with audiologist and parent coach, Dr. Lilach Saperstein. Why is our sense of hearing so crucial to emotional relationships? Like, you know, emotion is like how we guide our lives. I mean, (laughs) you know, we try with logic, but. (laughs) Yeah. So I would like to give my my real kind of spiritual metaphysical answer for that one. (laughs) Sure. Which which is that it's. You know, I, I kind of hate going to like the vibration route, like, mm-hmm. oh, high vibration, but yeah. it's literally true. Like yeah. it's the science is that sound is moving particles. Sure. And when someone says something and then that resonates with you, like the word resonate, that is physically what's happening. You are moving different parts of your like neurochemistry in response to what they said or what sound you heard. Mm-hmm. So like, I don't know so much about all that stuff the way people talk about it like in a spiritual way whatever but from a neurophysics way my gosh uh i think it's it's such a moving like again you have that word things are moving (laughs) yeah yeah even resonance is a vibration (laughs) yeah exactly (laughs) yeah so i think we have a lot of the relationship between things that we hear and how that affects us emotionally I mean, that's true for all our senses. Like you could feel something tactily or visually and different senses will give you also obviously emotional input, but this is my jam. So yeah, I feel like there is a special place for the timbre of your voice, like the tone, minor keys and major keys. Like there's so much there. This is Cheryl Holling, host and creator of the podcast, 19 Stories from Fear to Hope. I'm also an avid listener of your podcast, Jody, and given you're about to celebrate the release of your 100th episode and inquired about our favorite episode, I'd have to say that as much as I enjoy all of your wonderful guests, I so appreciate your solo episodes, especially your most recent one entitled Positive Vibes Only. The amount of research you do, the really interesting information you provide, and your delivery always makes me feel like I'm listening to an audio documentary where everything you describe comes to life. Congratulations on your 100th episode, and I look forward to the next 100 ones. I also spoke with Hamish McDonald, Managing Director of Squeaky Clean Studios, in episode number 71. Here's a small taste of our conversation. 
talking about the science of all this, because you had mentioned that you have external partners. So how does the how did you figure out that this would be a thing, that this would work? <laughs> well, I, again, the, I think it just goes back to that subjective um, idea in that, you know, we can tell you what the best piece of music is that we feel. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the CMO might believe that that's the best bit of music or he might believe a different one is. But, you know, what is going to resonate with the listener and what is going to evoke the right emotions and what is going to be listened to 190 million times or whatever, you know, uh, you know, like a Netflix logo, uh, Sonic logo, mm -hmm. um, and still maintains it, maintain its relevance or not lose yes. p lose its place uh, in relevance over two decades. And you not know, annoy you so much that you just want to speed through it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I have, there's a few of those out there that I'm uh, sure. just yes, there are. rub me the wrong way. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, um, and so, you know, it, we really went, okay, well, look, we can pretend that we have the expertise in-house, um, mm -hmm. or we can look out and see who is the best in the world or in the market that um, can advise us so mm -hmm. that we can bring them on at an early stage and really direct our creatives, our creative directors and our composers and our engineers who are all going to have a look at this brief um, and hone that direction um, and then let us loose. And we find that we get the best results that way. And what we also do is, you know, the CMO should take a lot of comfort in that this is actually not just a well-written piece of music, um, this actually is written in a way that is relevant to your brand, your brand positioning, your your customer base. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think you really, you could always get a good result, but do you know that it's a good result? And, you know, I think as we spoke before, you know, a great Sonic logo, you know, you don't know that immediately. I don't care who you are, yeah. Brian Eno or not, you know, you, you don't know that you've got a great Sonic logo until it's been in the market and it's tried and tested and, you know, it's either sitting in, uh, as an earworm or it's not. Here's a portion of episode number 36 with casting director and coach Mary Lynn Wisner. Is there a particular time when you felt that as a casting director, you were able to help a client get exactly what they needed in, you know, in a way that they may not have thought they could get? Absolutely. When did you, when did it work particularly well <laughs> is what I guess I'm asking. Um, I'm asking. Lots of times. And I, again, that's why any good producer hires a casting director because the, like I was saying earlier, they know what they, they know what they want or they think they know what they want, but sometimes they, and especially if they trust you, you have a good relationship with that producer. Um, they know, yeah, Mary Lynn also thinks outside the box a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so I've always done that with my casting. Um, I just, a perfect example, last year, um, towards the end of the year, we did a, a big campaign for Alfa Romeo and have to have a guy, got to have a guy. And they were very particular about this type of voice they wanted, maybe sort of a, you know, a, a continental accent and the whole thing. And of course, I brought those types of guys in, but I threw in a couple of women. I just threw in about three women. Mm -hmm. And they were like, ah, huh. They came back and they said, let's hear a couple more women. And they booked a woman, you know, so that's things like that, you know, or maybe sometimes they're thinking they've, you know, not just, a, you know, the different sex, but sometimes maybe they're so sure that they need, um, you know, a, a sort of type of voice, like a super raspy voice or something mm -hmm. like that. Yep. And then maybe there's just one girl, maybe she doesn't quite have the raspy voice, but it's her phrasing or, you know, sort of the way she, she you know, she, she's puts her own punctuation in a sentence or something like that. Um, and I showcased that in an audition and they like that, you know, that's, that's a job as a casting director is to kind of open up the minds a little bit of your producers and say, what if, or you know what, she's got such a great range. She's going to give you a lot of fun stuff at the session. Yeah. So um, any good producer knows that, you know, or trusts that about you as a casting director. I don't know, just picking one out of all the amazing content there's been between the podcast and Clubhouse, it would be tough to do. But if I had to pick one, I think it would be the podcast with Brandy Sanders. 
there was so much information, good information there crammed into 60 minutes and she has so much energy doing it. Um, that is still one of my favorite audio branding podcasts. So thank you, Jody. This is a small part of episode number 29 with multimedia storyteller Brandy Sanders. So multimedia storytelling, where does audio branding come into this? I remember reading this. I, I'm, you're going to have to quote me on this, but it might have been Harvard Business Review. It was like the familiar Intel bong, you know, it's played somewhere in the world once every five minutes, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's a, a simple five note tone. And it's got the memorable slogan that everyone knows by now, which is Intel Inside, right? And yep. so uh, bah, bah, bah. sight, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? So sight, yeah. along with sound, accounts for like 99% of all brand information presented to consumers, right? And that is, that's a hell of a statistic. <laughs> so obviously one is more widely used in mass marketing since, you know, we have radio and digital and podcasts and, you know, all of these different, many different channels where we're consuming things like obviously through our ears, through like auditory senses. And well, it's also, um, it's also universal. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to have the English language. In exactly. Order to recognize. Yep. It's global. It's not like, Hey, this yeah. is particular to APAC or or just mm -hmm. North America knows Intel inside, you know what I mean? Or yeah. the Apple, you know, the Mac, the Mac key up noise, right? Like everyone mm -hmm. knows that. Um, I remember it was actually in the movie Wally -E at one point, and everyone in the audience <laughs> was like, oh. And that yeah. that is the power of auditory mm -hmm. branding, right? Is like I know they all knew what Twinkies were too. So oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Take me to your so, trash you know. pile, Wally. -E. Um <laughs> But I mean, when we when we talk about like measuring the purchase intent difference between like pre and post exposure of sonic logos and music, the propensity to buy, I think it grows as much as like 146 percent. Here's a portion of episode number 30 with marketing upheaval expert Rudy Fernandez. Speaking of the science aspect of this, because you had mentioned that sound is a very intimate medium, and I totally agree. Um, have you uh, looked into this, uh, the science of this as it pertains to sound or, you know, do you use like scientific aspects to make sure that your clients um, get the best ads? I mean, <laughs> obviously there's there's something to how our brains work in, in order to make this more effective. <laughs> yes. In terms of sound, in terms. So most of the, the science that we usually are studied in and and. Uh use when we talk to clients are, are the science of decision making and, and behavior change. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not specific to audio, but, you know, there are several, you know, there's there's models of behavior change and there's, you know, things like the consequence model, the identity model. And so a lot of those things play into what we do audio wise and the intimacy of it. Um, you know, there are reasons why we engage with a certain brand and not others. There are reasons why we decide to change our behavior entirely mm -hmm. uh, or not, you know? So, so I think that what we've become expert in and brought in people who are expert in is just what are those, what are those things that are going to make someone go from never thought about it to, you know, huh, maybe, or how am I going to find out more to, I'm going to try it once to, I do this all the time. Yeah. And, and how do you hit people on those continuum to try to get, try to make that happen? Are you looking for ways to improve your company's or podcast's impact? You'd be surprised how powerful the use of an intentional audio branding strategy can be. Want to know more? I have a free downloadable PDF that gives you my five tips for implementing an intentional audio strategy at voiceoversandvocals.com slash audio dash branding dash strategy. That location does ask to put you on a mailing list just to send you updates on when the new podcasts come out. But if you really don't want to give your email out, I understand. Just contact me directly. My email is all over my website, and I'll make sure you get that PDF without needing to sign up anywhere. If you do sign up, though, you also get access to a resources section called The Studio, where I have videos, white papers and PDFs, discounts from my guests, and snippets of audio from my guests that no one else gets to hear. So maybe it's worth your while. Totally up to you. And of course, if you're looking for voiceovers, you can get in touch with me about that too. Now, back to the podcast. Here's a snippet of episode number 42 with creative director and composer Nick Crane. What advantages are there to having an artist actually compose something specifically for your project? Oh, well, I think that's, that's such a great thing for a brand because it just gives you kind of an integrity, you know? 
I mean, that's interesting. Okay, yeah. It, integrity is hard to come by in advertising. Mm-hmm. I think originality is hard to come by too. Um, but the two of the most valuable things you can have on a project, and if you pair up with a, an artist who's writing something for you that also has their own following and their own reputation, it's like a cross branding kind of thing. You know, it's like mm-hmm. you're cross promoting. How does this help um, a company with their audio brand? Um, I'm assuming that you choose artists or types of music that match with the company's particular branding. Um, Do you sit down with them and have this kind of discussion with the company uh, to, you know, decide what kind of music and, and what kind of sound and feel they're after? Yeah. Yeah, of course. That's the first step. Um, and companies, you know, by the time they're talking to me, they have a very specific brand identity, you know, that, I mean, Mm -hmm. that's been well hashed out. And so it's, that's a fairly easy part of the process because they know, they know what their identity is. And then it's just about finding a musician that pairs with that. Do you ever have clients approach you when they don't know this information, when they're just figuring it out themselves? Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And what uh, do you tell them? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I I just try to be really open minded and try to push the boundaries a little bit. I I oftentimes, you know, will think of an artist. I'll have ideas of things that could work, you know, in my imagination that I think might might be a good pairing. Mm -hmm. Um, It might be a good fit for them. And I just I just run through suggestions. And and I, I like when that's the case, because I get to have a little more voice in the process. And so it's nice when I get to kind of pitch ideas, you know, in that case. But I'd say for me, though, like 90 percent of the time they know they kind of know what they are when they come into it. So I'm somebody who's helping them find what they like, find a match. This is part of episode number 53 with iHeartMedia audio producer Macha Gruber, now Macha Kane. You're talking about producing commercials. Have you seen any trends since when you first started doing those those commercials? And when I ask about trends, I mean type of copy, type of voice, type of I mean music obviously changes, but you know, tone, um how upfront the voice is or, you know, things like like that. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. The the millennial craze definitely took uh commercials to a different level. About 15 years ago, it was very much informational. Mm -hmm. So here's the information and here is, you know, what we want to tell you and what we're selling you and why we're selling it to you and why you should buy this. Now, it's actually it's changing again. I'll give it that it's changing again. But um, when the millennial craze came up, it turned into I don't care if you buy this. I just want you to listen to what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't I I really don't care. You can make your own decisions. You have all the information at your fingertips. You can research this on your own. I just don't care. But here, if you want to buy this, sure, go for it. And it's just (laughs) turned into very it turned into very much lackadaisical, you Mm -hmm. know, like not in your face. Just mention the brand name. Just, you know, make someone listen real quick with a quick uh, humor or you know, something interesting or a lot of those, you know, like the the talk back, like, Bob, you're not supposed to say that on the radio kind of thing. Those are yeah. all gone. Uh-huh. You know, like the announcer voices are all gone. Um, you know, so it turned into a real people. Real people is the word that you'll see everywhere you audition is mm-hmm. conversational, natural, yep. uh, talking to a friend, you know, because nobody wants to be talked to anymore. They mm-hmm. want to be talking with. We're in the age of voice first, and yes, it's a relatively young industry, so it's going to require a combined effort and partnerships between designers, developers, and the voiceover industry that I'm a part of. Jody's audio branding podcast provides a space where, as a guest or as a listener, we all can share and be inspired. Here's some of episode number 77 with Sonic Branding Strategist and CEO of Pirate Group, Inc., Tom Emanson. Getting into the um, the methodology of all this, you have mentioned before that you have a three-step methodology. We do. We, what we discovered along the way 
was that some, and I'm going to back up a little bit because that Paul <laughs> sure. Moore story was from something very specific, but sure. over the course of my career, I've been asked many times to come up with um, a musical device, be it a jingle, which is a full song, mm-hmm. or just a mnemonic or sonic identity device just for the end of a, a brand's commercial, the five notes. <laughs> Um, but oftentimes that is the brief. We don't know what we need. We just need five notes mm-hmm. and we need them for Monday. And so, <laughs> okay, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. There's no rationale behind it other than there's a need. Um, and as a result, we come up with our five notes and Monday, everybody shows up and we play them and they like them or they don't like them. They don't know. There's no strategic rationale behind it. They just accept it for what it is. And that's more often than not the kiss of death of that mnemonic. It will last for the duration of that commercial and then never to be used again because no one can explain why it exists. Yeah. What we have found over the course of time, though, was that when we we sat down and sort of hashed it out with the agency and the creative team as to what are we trying to say with this mnemonic? What does it mean? What's What's the emotive takeaway? All those things started to become what, of course, influences what we write. Is it going to be sound effects? Is it going to be music? Is it going to be human voices at a combination of all of them or two of them? All of this comes out in that process of, mm-hmm. of uh, distilling what we're doing and why we're doing it. And ultimately, what happened over time was we started to see the hits and we started to see the misses. And we started to a- ask ourselves, okay, why are these missing and why are these sticking? The ones that stick were always subject to a strategic rationale for their existence. Mm-hmm. And, and, and the strategic ra- rationale is, in fact, what removed the subjectivity, which the others were filled with, because there was no answer as to why. Filmmaker Kevin Elliott was my guest on episode number 87, and here's a small portion of what we talked about. Getting more into the, the filmmaking of this, and I, I, I love how you make everyone on your set feel comfortable. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned that you have three promises and I, I know that I saw this on your website, I'm pretty sure, yes. um, so that you will make videos that move people. And I'm, I'm wondering what those three promises are and, mm-hmm. and how you do that. Sure. We thought a lot about our brand. Who do we want to be in the world? There are principles you build a brand upon and follow them and you will do okay. If you don't, if you, they, they are principles like physics. They just, they are what they are. So we thought a lot about what our brand represented, what our brand promises were, the kind of clients we wanted to attract, all those things. So our, our three promises, we boiled this down. What do we want to promise that we will give to people? The first promise is that you and your organization will look their best. We promise that you will want to show this video to people. And the third promise is your video will move people. And that's why they want to show it around because we all want to be moved. At the end of the day, we make most of our decisions. We live most of our life emotionally. We, we like to think we don't, but we do. So the thing that we at we Wall Films, I think that we do really well and using music. I'm telling you, it's such a big deal, a part of our process. I was going to ask you how sound plays into that. Oh, my yeah. gosh. It's cr- <laughs> so Courtney has this. If you look, go look at our stuff, she has this real gift for finding for one shooting in this really cinematic style. She just has a touch. But then also she notices and she catches these little human moments that other people don't see from angles. And it's remarkable. But. On top of that is the music is what grabs people, really grabs their heart. If you have a beautiful visual, that's fine. But you add a beautiful or or even better, unexpected music track to it and it snatches them and they can't stop watching because now they're feeling an experience like we do at a movie theater or anything else. And so, yeah, at music, I'll tell you. Music, choosing the music takes almost as long as as editing a video for us sometimes. We're very careful about it. This is Ann Ganguza, voice talent coach and demo producer and host of the VO Boss podcast. Jody, I am such a fan of your audio branding podcast. I love how you explore the depths of how audio affects and influences us. And it's a topic that is so especially relevant for us in the voiceover industry. Your podcast should be required listening for all who want to elevate their brand and make more meaningful connections. Thank you for all you do for your listeners. And I can't wait for the next episode. 
Here's part of episode number 62 with Dr. Cornelius Ringa and Lars Ollendorf of the Audio Branding Academy and Hamburg Berlin based sound agency We Sound. How do, you, how do both of you define audio branding? You've sort of touched on it already, but I'm wondering if your definitions are the same or if they're different or because you're coming at it from slightly different angles, right? Quite. But I, I wouldn't say that our, uh, our, different, uh, our, our, our defini definitions uh, differ so much. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I think we can agree it's a process. Mm -hmm. And we agree it takes design a good designer or a better a team off. Mm -hmm. um, it needs a proper uh, consultancy and uh, strategy. And, of course, the client who's willing to participate in all this. Sure. And uh, with these three, uh, you can make a pretty good progress. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's important to, to understand that there's, there's a process mm -hmm. and there are some methodologies, how you organize. It's mainly about the organization of this process. When, what, how, checklist, did we think of everything? Yeah. And at the end, you have a brand. In our business, at the end, you have the brand sound. So for mm -hmm. me, audio branding is the process of development uh, and developing and also maintaining yeah, mm. a brand sound. And that is like super important to also keep an eye on the implementation because this is often forgotten. Uh, so we have our wonderful process, everything runs smoothly mm -hmm. and in the end we have the best sound logo of the world but unfortunately it's not on the streets nobody mm -hmm. hears it why yeah. because it's not properly imp implemented in uh, processes yes. within the company sure. and that's another yeah important side to work on yes absolutely so it starts with the implementation and then it becomes audio management okay and i think at the moment everybody Still, everybody is asking about how do you create it and why and what is the, the story and always asking about the creative mm -hmm. questions. As I said, it's important. I and we we think we need the methodology in the process to have this creative process. But the success of a brand sound at the end, on the long term, is implementation and then the management of the brand, the yep. management of the brand sound, the daily sure. work. Mm -hmm. The daily updates, the little adjustments. This is part of episode number 50 with co-founder and CXO of Audio UX, Eric C. I like what you talk about um, modular like, because that's that's really a fascinating aspect. I guess the audio end of this can translate to people no matter what language they speak. And Definitely. different music tones and things like that work for different parts of the world. So you could have the same kind of notes, but maybe use different instruments in different parts of the world, um, you know, to relate to wherever the person hearing it is hearing it. <laughs> it's very true. It's actually something that MasterCard has been doing with their yes. audio branding right now, mm -hmm. um, which is interesting. And, and yeah, in that way of modularity, they're, they're swapping out the audio aesthetic. So the, the core motif or the, the melody they're playing remains the same, mm -hmm. but what we call the audio aesthetic or the, the skin or the the instrumentation used is what gets swapped out. And that's something that I think McDonald's does really well mm -hmm. where they have their five note mnemonic, but it's usually played in whatever instrumentation the rest of the commercials in. And so yeah. that's what keeps it evergreen in that sense. It makes there's, a lot of sense. Yeah. There's other interesting things you can do modularly. One of which is more more of a, an ear con or a UX sound, but also an audio logo is, is something we did for an Alexis skill. Steven Arkanovich um, developed the big sky weather skill for, uh, for Alexa. And mm -hmm. what we did in that situation is there's already conditional variables built in to the framework. So it's already calling um, some APIs to tell you what the weather is. And so depending on what it's serving back to you, you'll get a different sound. 
Now they're all based on the core audio logo, the, the same melody, but depending on what the weather is, sound of, of that weather will be layered in. So oh, I see. If it's, okay. Yeah, and so it, that way, within a split second, if you invoke the, the Big Sky app, you can hear if there's rain layered underneath the logo. You already know from an EarCon perspective that you, know, you should grab your umbrella instead of your sunglasses. <laughs> Hi, it's Christoph Trapp. Um, Jody's podcast has really been a fantastic resource for me. I listen to it every week when it comes out. I always learn something new. Audio branding is really not something that was always top of mind for me, even though I spent my day creating content of all kinds of different types. So fantastic show. Would highly recommend it. Jody is definitely an expert in the field. Going back quite a bit to one of the earliest interviews, this is part of episode number eight with sound designer and studio owner John McLean. Could you talk a little more about the evolution of sound as far as how it affects us? Because I know you mentioned that in your course too, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's it's all based on evolution. You know, if if we are um, if we're cavemen and we're sitting around the fire at night, and if the biosphere suddenly goes very quiet or you know much like in jurassic park we hear the big kaboom of something branches breaking whatever Mm -hmm. you know that's that's telling us that there's a predator in the area possibly a predator that's a bigger predator than us higher up on the food chain sure and so you know over the millennia we've developed the reaction to these changes in the sonosphere if you will and we react to it. And we, we even still to this day react to it. We just don't realize it as much. But, you know, as I say in the lecture that you got a chance to look through, mm-hmm. we um, like silence. I always tell voice talent when I'm uh, directing them or when I'm coaching, uh, I, I tell my students silence is like one of the most effective arrows in your quiver. Because silence is something we're not used to, especially in modern society. Oh, yeah. So if something that we're listening to suddenly goes quiet, that causes us to notice it. You know, our brain's this amazing tool that keeps us on whatever task we're focused on. And one of the ways that it does that is it filters out all of the other sound that we don't notice. Mm -hmm. But if the world suddenly goes quiet, our brain goes, whoa, pay attention to that. There's something going on. And to end this retrospective on a particularly positive note for the future, here's a part of episode number 89 with voice-first influencer, physician, speaker, author, and podcaster, Dr. Terry Fisher. You mentioned something called uh, hashtag voice is my OS. (laughs) Voice is my operating system. (laughs) Yeah. I kind of love that. (laughs) Thanks. Yeah. So that's that's a a little campaign that I started uh, for social media, um, you know, when I was sort of synthesizing some of these ideas about voice and and how compelling it is, um, I started to think about it in terms of, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, you know, there was first MS DOS as an as a, as a operating system with the keyboard, mm-hmm. and then there was MS Windows with the mouse, and then there's like iOS with the phone. And now, like, what do you call this when we're now operating or when we're interfacing with computers with our voice? And I realized. It's actually a voice operating system. That's the way I work. I I communicate, you know, through my through my voice. Um, and so there are different companies. If you really want to break it down and get technical, there are different companies. Just the way there's like iOS versus Android. The the examples that I use is well, there's Amazon Alexa or Google Assistant, but they both function off of the sound of your voice. Mm-hmm. And so in my mind, that's that's what I mean by like voice is an operating system. Um, and it's my operating system because that's how I am. Uh, that's how I'm working. So, so voice is my OS is that hashtag that I created. Um, and you know, it, it's just a, it's a fun thing. People can go and they can they can if they want to kind of contribute a reason why they feel that voice is their OS, they can actually go to voicesmyos.com, and we're happy to have them input. You know, just put in a headshot and you know the reason why voice is their operating system, and we'll we'll create a graphic for them uh, featuring them and their quote that they can share if they'd like to. It's a it's a kind of a fun way to kind of get the word out and, and just get more, more excitement around voice. 
Well, that's the end of this episode. Thanks for listening. And if you like what you heard, why not tell a friend about this podcast? It's available in all the usual locations. Until next time. Thank you.